Okay, so the Charlie Harris principle basically says things get messed up, things get shaken up, you establish a new normal, and you go from there. When we were looking at our little system um, on Friday, okay, so we've got our nice little closed system. And remember, this requires that it's a closed system. We have sucked out all the air. We got nothing in there but water, liquid water, and vapor water. And those particles are constantly moving. And every now and then, one escapes from liquid, makes it to vapor. Every now and then, one of those vapor particles hits the surface, gets sucked into the quicksand that is the liquid phase. So constantly moving. And, you know, stuff just happens. So if we don't change any of the conditions that this thing is under, and let's say we have... 100 molecules in the vapor phase and 100 molecules in the liquid phase. And we said, you know, this bounces back and forth, 101, 99, you know, the numbers go back and forth. If we put heat under this thing, if we heat the entire system, the rate of change is going to change for a moment, and we're going to have more particles going which direction? Towards vapor. So when we think about the equilibrium, liquid plus heat equals vapor. If we heat the system, we're going to shift the equilibrium towards the vapor phase. And we call that shifting it right. No, I'm not a big fan of anything that uses left and right. I don't get it. Um, if we, you know, so the rate of change is going to shift. Initially, we're going to have more particles leaving, va leaving liquid going into vapor. But then it's going to settle back down. And now maybe our new normal is 150 and 50. But we do get a new normal. And then as long as we maintain the same temperature and the same pressure, guess what? The rate of change is equal. And we maintain rough, roughly 150 in vapor and 100 in liquid. <laughs> So that Le Chatelier's is really important because it says you can disrupt a system, it will settle down to a new normal. The rate of change will be different for a while, and then you'll go back to that equal rates of change. You will establish another equilibrium at that higher value. Now, what if instead of heat, we stick this puppy in an ice bath? These are supposed to be ice cubes. You wouldn't know that if you weren't told, I'm sure. So if we cool the system significantly, so now what are we doing? Well, we're taking this same um, equilibrium equation, and we're shifting the equilibrium again, but which direction are we shifting it? Yeah, towards the liquid and the heat being given off. So if we ice this whole system, what we're going to see is that we go from, whoops, that 150 and 50, and initially the rate of change is going to favor the liquid phase. Initially we're going to have more particles. So we, we had it at 100 and 100, we heated it. Now we've got more particles in the vapor phase than the liquid phase. Now we're going to ice it down. And depending on how far we ice it, um, you know, this might end up, we might end up with 50 here and 150 here. I mean, we, could, we could stop at any place, but we're basically shifting the equilibrium towards the liquid phase. So for a while, the rate of change, the, there are going to be more particles that are leaving vapor and getting trapped by liquid because they're slowing down. They're cooling down, so they're slowing down. The slower you are going, the easier it is to get caught. You all played tag as kids, I assume, right? Yeah, the slower you're going, the easier it is to get nabbed. The slower those vapor particles are moving, the easier it is for the attractive forces between their buddies in the liquid phase to grab them because they, they want to be in that party. Water is only attracted to two things in the entire universe, self and everything else. It wants to be part of the party. It's very attracted to all those molecules that are down in the liquid phase hanging out and holding hands. But in the vapor phase, it's just moving too fast. It doesn't have time for that. Once you start to slow it down, it's much easier to snag. So again, we cool it down. Initially, the rate of change, um, you've got more things entering liquid than leaving liquid. 
but, but eventually it settles down to, you know, one in, one out, one in, one out, one in, one out. Okay, that's Le Chatelier's principle. And that does come up, I think, on some science testing stuff. Yes, ma'am. Um, would, there, would there be a new equation? No. With um, phase change equilibrium, it's not quite like a chemical reaction. Um, we can describe equilibrium in reactions, too, because there are reactions that are reversible. Um, but in phase change, we're really just talking about um, the states it can exist in and whether it requires heat to shift the equilibrium or whether heat is created. So when a molecule goes from vapor phase and gets captured by the liquid phase, at the point, it's already slow enough to get caught, but at the point when it condenses, it actually gives off some heat energy. Have I, have I told you guys yet about the um, strawberry fields? Have we talked about this? Okay. So I'll just reference the strawberry fields again. If we have um, solid, liquid, and gaseous water, if a molecule goes from here to here, what happens to that amount of energy? It's yeah, it's released out into the, into the world, out into the universe. Um, if you're spraying liquid water on strawberries on a May night, much like this weekend was, um, and there was a thing on NPR the other morning about um, growers in some place in California, they were having a cold snap, and growers were pumping irrigation onto fruit fields. Same reason, save the crop. So, um, you know, here, when one of those particles goes from being in the vapor phase to being liquid, it gives off a little bit of heat. In order to get something from the liquid phase to the vapor phase, you have to sort of kick it in the butt. You have to give it energy. Okay? Questions on that? Chatelier's. Let's run, if we can get this to work, let's run the um, simulation of Le Chatelier's. <clears throat> so this is just the, the shifting equilibriums under Le Chatelier's. The only ones that I really want you to get are the heating and cooling. Um, the volume and pressure ones just get really weird, and you can reason through them, and you can look at your book, and they do a good job of walking you through it. But what I really want you to understand is the shifts in equilibrium that happen with heating or cooling the system. So don't worry about the rest of them. Worry about those. Okay, so solidification. This is the other phase change, the other end of phase change. Um, freezing and melting. So either going from a liquid to a solid or going from a solid to a liquid. And this is the point where liquid and solid states are in equilibrium. The temperature at which those are in equilibrium at normal atmospheric pressure. What that means is that if I give you a closed system with ice and water and no vapor whatsoever in it, and it's at 1 atm, and it's at 0 celsius. You will have molecules that are joining the solid and molecules that are leaving the solid. Molecules that are, you know, exchanging positions between the solid and the, and the liquid phase at equal rates. They're in equilibrium. So it's, it's more than just the point at which water freezes. It's actually the point where they're in equilibrium. It's in equilibrium with its liquid phase. Can you have liquid water at zero Celsius? Yes, you can. But at zero Celsius and normal atmospheric pressure, you're going to have a pretty healthy exchange between the solid and liquid phase. Once you drop below zero at normal atmospheric pressure, you're not going to have liquid water anymore. But at zero, you can have both liquid and solid water. At 100, you can have both gaseous and liquid water. Same thing, they're in equilibrium at normal atmospheric pressure in closed system. So looks awfully familiar, doesn't it? It's the same kind of equilibrium equation. A solid plus heat gives you liquid. A liquid transitioning to a solid lets off heat. That's why you can save a patch of strawberries by irrigating heavily. Um, so actually, the fact that it was really rainy and wet on that cold weekend we got probably helped some plants do a little bit better because you probably overnight had some water freezing, possibly on the plant surface, and that, that actually protects them. It's protective. 
Okay, so if you had 18.02 grams of solid water of ice, the amount of energy it would take to completely melt that, completely liquefy it, that's molar heat effusion. Um, the more attracted particles in a substance are to one another, the more energy it's going to take to move them from being a solid to being a liquid or from being a liquid to being a gas. Okay? Well, I wasn't recording anyway. Um, so this is the same, you know, ice cubes, we say quote-unquote evaporating. They actually sublimed in the freezer. Um, you sublimed ammonium chloride. Wet laundry on a line in January will dry. It will take a lot longer than on a warm, sunny day wet laundry to dry. Um, it tends to happen again at low temperature. It can also happen at real low pressure. Um, so sublimation happens at altitude more readily than it would happen at sea level. Okay, that gets us to this thing, which is something that's really going to help you on the ACT. Did you see one of these on your ACT? Anybody remember seeing something like this on the ACT? No? Okay. I'm surprised. Unless, unless they've changed the test and I need to catch back up. Um, for the last few years, people have said when we got to this, oh my gosh, there was one of those on the ACT and I had never used one before. Okay, good. Then, you know, you should do better after taking this class. Um, this is a phase change diagram. And there are a couple important... What is it showing on each axis? Well, on this axis, it's showing temperature, and on this axis, it's showing pressure. So you're looking at a relationship between temperature and pressure, and these lines are the boundaries between various phases. So to get some practice using this, and we are going to have some practice from the book on using this, if, and this is for water, if water is below, let's get rid of that, and they have these handy little dashed lines here. If water is below 0 0.01 Celsius ATM and 0 0.0006, I'm sorry, um, ATM, this is ice. Well, basically anywhere below, I mean, here's, here's zero. So for the most part, below zero, at normal, you know, there's, there's the junction of 0 and 1 atm. So anything below 0 and 1 atm, it's definitely a solid. Are there pressures at which the solidification point of water is lower than 0? Yeah. Higher temperatures or lower temperatures? I'm sorry, higher pressure or lower pressure? Well, so, yeah, down in this range, at some very low pressures, you can have water, even as a vapor, well down below zero. But here's the weird part. At very high pressure, you can also have some water. I mean, here's, let me draw in our zero line. There's our zero line. So in this area, very high pressure, you can actually have liquid water below zero. All right. So this thing, okay, so the basics. Here, here we've got our solid water. Whoops. Generally low temperature. Here we have this big, wide swath of world where water is a liquid. And in general, that would be above zero, and I drew that line badly. And in general, at normal atmospheric pressure, below 100. So, you know, there's, whoops, there's your range at normal atmospheric pressure. As we get up to higher pressures, if we look at this line, 218 ATM, so that's 200 times normal atmospheric pressure. What happens to the temperature that you have to get water to to make it a gas? So we're looking at this line here. Does temperature increase or decrease? decrease. It increases. Um, who here has ever been 
up to a really tall mountain. Who's been to the Rockies? Okay. Or even like the, like the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, places like that. So you get up above um, sea level a good bit, and it takes, um, it changes how water boils. So they talk about, um, you know, planning fuel for a trip up at elevation is different because your water boils, actually it boils at a lower temperature because, you know, here's 100. Well, as we go down in pressure, the point, the temperature at which water boils drops. Well, likewise, if we put water in a pressure cooker, the temperature at which water boils increases. Who here has ever used a pressure cooker? Okay. Um, I should have brought my pressure cooker in. The idea behind pressure cooking food is that you can get it well above our normal 100. You can get it up to like 250 Fahrenheit. You can get the temperature much higher because it's under high pressure. So we're going to look at a quick video. Record any of that. Um, triple point, you can have all three phases in equilibrium. Critical point is the point of pressure above which you cannot get something to vaporize. So there's too much pressure, the molecules just can't escape. Okay, so we've got critical point, critical temperature. And we can do a phase diagram for anything. So what I'm going to have you do is look at some practice problems in your book on phase diagrams before we start to talk about vapor pressure. From the chapter 12 review number 36 and number 37, number 36 references a diagram and that diagram is on page 381. So what I'm going to give you um, after the break is the lab packet for the phase change lab, also known as the ice cream lab. Because um, I want you to start thinking about it, and you can do some of the pre-lab work reading that packet. We're probably going to make ice cream middle of next week. So tomorrow I'll have a sign-up sheet for materials, and we'll go from there. So right now I'll let you work on these and practice, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about some other things. Um, 36, skip B. Pardon? Um, hold on. Skip B and D. So here's what I wanted to just clarify, because I'm thinking maybe it wasn't totally clear. And this is the phase, change, the phase diagram from your book. This is CO2. Um, notice that CO2, which, which um, phase comprises the largest area of that graph? Yes. Gas. Under most conditions that we are familiar with it, CO2 is a gas. Can you make it a liquid? Yes. Can you make it a solid? Yes. But for the most part, under fairly normal conditions, like in this room, CO2 is a gas. The thing that I wanted to make clear that I think maybe wasn't is that anywhere, at any point along this line, under the conditions of pressure and temperature where they meet on that line, it is... Um, it's in equilibrium between the two phases that are meeting. So on that line, you've got particles in the solid phase, particles in the liquid phase, and they're going back and forth at that equal rate. Um, on this line, you've got particles in the liquid or the gas phase, and here, and CO2 is one that sublimes really, um, really readily, you've got particles in the solid and the gas phase that are going back and forth. Um, where's the triple point for this one? Right there. So like 5 atms and negative 60 celsius. Pretty darn cold. The I have, so here's what I have for you. I, I want to briefly, we're basically going to wrap up chapter 12. We haven't talked a lot about a lot of stuff, but I want to talk about water quickly, and then I'm going to give you one last thing to practice with, and I'm going to count that as your quiz grade and cut you loose to work on it. So... Water, this is all we're going to say about it. It's one section in this chapter. All we're going to say is, it's special. Aside from the fact that it's so darn attractive, um, it's bent. You remember that from Chapter 6. You built lots of water, and those unshared pairs force the hydrogens down, so you get a bent molecule rather than a linear molecule. Here's the weird part. 
just ice. Okay, well, let me, let me back that up. If I have a substance and I take it from being a liquid to a solid, does it get more dense or less dense? More dense. The solid is generally less dense than the liquid of the same thing. Solids are more dense than liquids. Liquids are more dense than gases, right? What about water? Does ice sink or float on liquid water? It floats. Well, if something floats on something else, that means it's less dense. Hmm. Well, when, whoops, when water's a liquid, and you remember Mickey's little ears, you remember measuring bond angles, the bond angle between those two hydrogens is this 104.9. Okay, so who cares? When you get Mickey really cold, when you freeze water, Mickey flattens out his ears, and I always think of a dog laying their ears back, and this bond angle is now 109. So unique among any substance that we know of in the universe, like seriously, we don't know of another substance in the universe that does this, it is less dense in its solid state than its liquid state because it spreads out and takes up just a little bit more room per molecule in its solid state. That is why your ice, clu ice cubes float in your glass of lemonade. That is why ice floats on ponds. If it didn't, ice would sink to the bottom of the ponds, they would freeze solid and they would never unfreeze. No life on earth as we know it. I mean seriously. The fact that water is less dense in its solid state than its liquid state really in some ways enables us to, I mean, it enables life as we know it on this planet. Okay, uh, molar heat of vaporization and fusion are unusually high. That's all you need to know. I don't care if you know any of those values. It would be really ridiculous for you to memorize them. What I want you to know is water is super attractive. Super attractive to itself and it's super attractive to everything else, um, which is why they have really high heats of vaporization because it takes a lot of energy to get them to let go of one another. That's it. That's all we're doing with Chapter 12. So what do I want you to get out of this? Using phase change diagrams, because they come up on the ACT sometimes. Um, knowing what triple point is. And, you know, you, and, and knowing Le Chatelier's equilibrium. Understanding the principle of phase change equilibrium. That's it. What I have for you that I am going to count as a quiz of sorts. This is a worksheet. Um, Mr. Gooch, Mr. Gooch Chemistry, who I just love, um, this is a worksheet from his honors chemistry class. It is a phase change diagram here and some explanation of phase change diagrams. Here it's a, a phase change diagram for some unknown substance. And on the back, you use that phase change diagram for the unknown substance to answer a series of questions. Pretty easy. You can do it as a take home, do tomorrow. Um, and actually, yeah, only up through 21. So you can skip 22 and 21, 22 and 23.